Господия де своє і у німа своє жене. Але, 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 але. Welcome back to Fruit of Medjugorje. Boy, do we have something exciting tonight. It was just at the beginning of March that uh, Father Leon, the English pilgrim, uh, priest in Medjugorje in charge of the English, was uh, spoke at a conference. As a matter of fact, he spoke around the United States, but he spoke at a conference at St. Mark's Church in Wilmington, North Carolina. And Mike, uh, Tom has shared it on the uh, channel, but so many people have asked us, where can we, we want to tell our friends about this. We want to draw, when can we watch this again? Yeah. And so we have it as a fruit show for us. It's so good. Father Leon, he's, you know, uh, he, I'm so proud of him mm -hmm. because he shares so much of his first pilgrimage to Medjugorje and the things that he saw and what Our Lady said to him. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful and uh, powerful and precious and important. It's important, y yes. Thank you, Father Leon, for this wonderful testimony, and we hope that many people can watch it. It's just yeah, awesome. it's he's also uh, a pleasure to listen to. He has a great personality. He's also funny. <laughs> and uh, it reminds us to pray for the priests in Medjugorje, not yeah. to take them for granted. Yeah. Pray for this mission mm -hmm. that Father Leon has to be the English priest in Medjugorje to yeah. kind of the oversee priest that. For the priest for the English-speaking. Priest for the English-speaking. And, okay, praise God. Enjoy. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? For a minute, I thought the deacon was going to give my whole talk. I was a bit nervous. <laughs> He's giving spoilers. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Now, sorry, let me just fix this. Okay. I'm going to start um, in a less obvious place. I want to start with objections to Medjugorje because lots of people are kind of close to Medjugorje even before listening to it. Many of you know family and friends that you've probably invited and they just said, no, it's not for me, and they didn't want to know anything about it. And the kind of reasons that people give, they say things like, the apparitions have gone on too long, or Ben in the video said, you know, what are you going to say every day? <laughs> well, let's look at how Our Lady behaves at other apparitions. First, the idea that she appears every day for... 38 years. Now, if this seems incredible, then we have to bear in mind that in Laus, in France, L-A-U-S, she appeared every day for 54 years. And that's approved. It was approved more recently under Pope Benedict. It happened about 350 years ago. Or Fatima, where she appeared to Sister Lucia for 88 years. You know, it's not just 1917. She continued appearing to Lucia for the rest of her life. And we know that now. You know, the nuns at Coimbra, the monastery where Sister Lucia was published, a biography of Sister Lucia, where they said, well, yeah, she continued having apparitions. Okay, so the duration of apparitions, therefore, does not rule it out. Having apparitions every day, messages every day, also doesn't rule it out. And then they say, well, well what could she be saying over and over again? And this, I have to admit, this breaks my heart because our Lady says there, the time will come when you will long for my messages, but you will not have them. You will long for my presence here, but it will not be so at that time. And she also says over and over again, pray to understand my presence among you, the grace of my presence here. Because if you think about Lourdes or Fatima, there's Marian's apparition sites approved by the church. And you can go there, 
and they're beautiful. I love them. I've never been to Fatima. I've been to Lourdes many times. But in Medjugorje, it's different. Something else is going on because Our Lady is there every day and she is guarding it. And you can feel that. I have to admit, you can feel that. Something is different. When priests go there and priests celebrate Mass or hear confessions there, they all come away and say, something is going on. You know, before I went to Medjugorje as a priest, I think the record I heard, I'm not breaking the seal of the confessional, but you know, maybe if someone hadn't gone in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that would have been my record that I'd heard. Medjugorje, yeah, that's nothing. 50 years, 60 years, that's normal. Okay, so many reconciliations going on. And also, if a priest sits down to hear confessions, if he's lucky, he'll get away six hours later. Okay. Something is going on. So, when people object and say, well, you know, these messages are, I don't know, boring and they're repetitive. If repetition means that you're fake, it means that every single mother who's had to repeat herself to a her child, saying, come down for dinner, wipe your feet, put your toys away, do your homework, that means all those mothers are fake because they had to repeat themselves. Okay, well, what it means is that we are bad children. If, if Our Lady has to repeat herself. As, as the deacon, oh, sorry, I forgot your name, but <laughs> he memorized my name, I forgot his. <laughs> sorry, my bad. As he said, Medjugorje is important in my life. Medjugorje is the reason that I came back to the faith properly. I, I didn't leave it, I didn't abandon it. I was raised Catholic, Catholic family. We prayed the rosary every day before dinner. And when I was a child, it was a real pain because sometimes it meant you missed the first half an hour of Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> you know? But anyway, but we, we, that's how we were raised. We said the rosary every day. And then in my teen years, I fell in with a group of evangelical Protestants. Uh, they were good people. And I, I did the whole happy clappy jumping around and all that kind of stuff. I don't do that now. I don't do that. Well, partly because my joints wouldn't do it, but also, I mean, it's not me. It's, I can do that. But anyway, <clears throat> as I like to say, I'm much better now. I'm cured. <laughs> they taught me a great love for the scriptures. But through Medjugorje, I came back to the fullness of the Catholic faith. I also credit my vocation to Medjugorje. So I never imagined I would ever end up there as chaplain to the English-speaking pilgrims. This is beyond my wildest dreams. You know, they, when my predecessor, my immediate predecessor, Father Kevin, was retiring, they said, oh, there's a short list and you should put your name down, you know, because they're looking for someone to succeed him. And I thought, no, I'm not going to bother. I've never won anything in my life, you know. Even Parish Tombola, I haven't even won like a bottle of sparkling water. <laughs> That's how unlucky I am, okay? So, uh, so I, saw, I, I didn't. I didn't put my name down. And this turned out to be a grace from God because later they told me that everyone who put the name down, the Franciscans had said, these are clearly unsuitable, you know, if they volunteered. So <laughs> and um, because people keep asking me, I'll tell you a quick story. I saw a flock of Dominicans, what a collective noun for Dominicans should be a summa of Dominicans, I suppose. A summa of Dominicans walking past. So I ran after them and they were from Zagreb, Croatia. And I was talking to them, there were about 12 of them, all students. And meanwhile, Father Marinko, who is the pastor of Medjugorje, he was coming the other side and he was going, ah, brace, brace, brothers, brothers. And he saw me and I clearly don't look like I come from Zagreb. <laughs> yeah? And he said, you, Father, Father, you, you come here many times, yeah? Sorry, I have to do the accent, I love it. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I do. Mm, good, good, you come, you come. And he took me into the, the office and it was, it was the room where in the early days, you know, in the early months of Medjugorje, 1981, the, uh, the room uh, in the parish house where they used to have the apparitions. And it was my first time going in there. So I was so excited. I was looking around like, oh, I can't believe it. I'm here in this room. And then he asked me a few questions. I think he said, um, what do I... What did I think was good about Medjugorje? 
What did I think Medjugorje needed and what languages I spoke? And once I answered all this, he said, good, good, you go now, you go. And then he, he threw me out of his office. <laughs> so that was it. I thought, okay, it was a friendly chat, Croatian style, you know. <laughs> and, and a couple of hours later, I had a text from the associate pastor, Father Stanko. And Stanko said, Father Marinko says, you come now. And I said, come now for what? He said, you come live here. So I thought, ah, that was a job interview. <laughs> so anyway, this is how I ended up living in Medjugorje. So I've been there now for four years, living there. I first went in 1991 when I was 20 years old. I was in the army. I grew up in Singapore, as the deacon said. So immediately after high school, we have no choice. You have to go to the army for two and a half years. If you're a, if you're a boy, you have to go into the army. The girls get away with everything. So they... They go off to college, but we go, to, go into the army for two and a half years. So I was in infantry, bullet fodder, as we used to say, running around, you know, shooting M16s and all that. And um, in the army, certainly I, God blessed me. He, I, I broke my spine in two places. But my section of the platoon, you know, I think it's the same here the, the, in the army. Each platoon is four sections. And in my section, it's, it's like 10, 12 guys. Uh, they were all Catholic. Well, all Catholic except one Protestant, uh, who was my buddy. And uh, it, what it meant was, in practical terms, because it, it, this was the Catholic section of the platoon, it had the foulest language. <laughs> <coughs> you know what Catholics are like. But when I broke my spine, the next minute, you know, one of, one of the guys, he brings out a bottle of holy water from Lourdes. And I thought, you brought... Holy water from Lourdes to, into the army, but I thought this was great, but you know, it was, so he used it on me, made me drink some of it and splash it on my back because it, you know, because it had broken my spine, but I didn't know it was broken, but God protected me and I had an operation later and recovered. Then I had to do the rest of my military service. It was a desk job by then, nine to five, well, eight to six, and I was going to mass every day after work. And that's where my vocation really grew. And the desire to become a priest increased in me. Because I realized, I thought, I like going to Mass. I like being in church. And I thought, well, priests are in church. Maybe, therefore, I should become a priest. This was my logic. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it was not to be. Because I told my parents, they were not happy. They were not happy at all. You know, Indian parents, uh, any, anyone Indian here, you'll know. You know what it's like. You know, Indian parents want you to be either a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, or something like that. Uh, even if they're Catholic, we're cradle Catholics. Um, so they're not pleased. And, you know, I see one Indian there. You know it's true, don't you? Okay. <laughs> and um, so I, I kind of chickened out, and I, after the army, I went to medical school in England. I became a doctor. And then, after that, I joined the Dominican Order and became a priest. So that's a very quick summary of my story coming up to how I became a priest and how Medjugorje played a role in all this. Now, I am not big on signs from God because mostly I'm not sure if I can trust them. So when I wanted to discern the priesthood, I said, please give me a sign that you want me to be a priest. And then the next minute, all kinds of strangers came up to me and said, oh, you should be a priest. Okay? <laughs> and I said to God, I'm sorry, this is not good enough. <laughs> and I mean it, I still mean it. I, still, I do not think this is good enough. It's not good enough. Because I'm not going to become a priest just because a bunch of crazy people told me. <laughs> you know? Because, why? Think about it logically. It could be they saw me, a young man in church, making his thanksgiving after communion. And all these, you know, pious ladies are there thinking, oh, I wish my children were at Mass. But here, here's this lovely young man. He was a lovely young man in those days. Uh, here's this lovely young man. Ooh, and then they'll come up to me and say, young man, young man, you should be a priest. Yeah? That's what's going on. I don't think that's divine grace. I still don't believe it. So, I'm not... And also, you shouldn't make such a decision based on such ephemeral phenomena. People coming up to you and saying something. That's not how we should live our lives. I hope, I don't know if you're surprised to hear me say this, but honestly, truly, I am not keen 
on signs and wonders. I really am not. I'll put it to you this way. What I want is to look for the more amazing thing. Now, what's more amazing? You see me drinking some water. Or you see me walking on water. What's more amazing? What's more amazing? Walking on water? Okay. Now, Jesus walks on water, and Jesus, sitting at the well, asks the Samaritan woman for a glass, for, for a drink of water. What's more amazing there? I know now, because you're all thinking, this is a trick question, I mustn't get it wrong. Yeah, it is a trick question. The difference is, for me to drink water, that's not amazing. For me to walk on water would be amazing. Yeah? But Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So, and he, he is the one who made every single molecule of water in the world. So for him to ask for a drink is far more amazing than for him to walk on water. Don't you think? Okay, that's what I'm after. So we have to look for what's actually more amazing. You know, someone came up to me in Medjugorje after Mass and she said, Father, Father, I received communion and I saw all these things, you know, angels coming out of the pillars and pink elephants dancing and whatever. I didn't, she didn't say pink elephants. That's an embellishment by me. Okay. Am I going to be impressed by this? Well, it's not about impressing me. I'm nobody. You don't have to impress me. But what's more amazing, the fact that she received communion, which is actually God, Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's really amazing. Or the fact that she saw angels and pink elephants, which is more amazing. That's the fact that she received communion, that she was communing with God. That's way more amazing, right? Okay. This is what I'm trying to say. So in Medjugorje, lots of people look for signs and wonders. Don't be like that. When you come to Medjugorje, don't run after signs. Don't run, run after these so-called wonders. Don't look for them. You don't need them. The greatest signs, again, as the deacon said, that I say, are confession and mass. Th these are the greatest signs of Medjugorje. Confession and holy mass. And no sign ever is going to be better than these two signs. Even when the permanent signs, you've, you've heard about the secrets of Medjugorje. The third secret is uh, a permanent sign will be left on Potburdo, on Apparition Hill, um, which will be beautiful and amazing to look at. But whatever it is, it will not be better than the Eucharist or Confession. It will not. Why? Because whatever it is, okay, because the Eucharist is actually Jesus. What's better than Jesus? Zilch. Confession is the forgiveness of God. What's better than that? Nada. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, that's why. Are you laughing because he said nada? Nishta. <laughs> 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 nothing. Absolutely nothing. Jesus is the most amazing thing. And there's nothing better than him. And Our Lady comes because of Jesus. Now that I've told you how much I'm against signs, I'm going to be hypocritical and tell you a story about signs. Because I need to establish the context. I went to Medjugorje, I was 20 years old the first time, and I did not go looking for signs. I was a very pious young man. I was wonderful in those days. Not, I wasn't terrible like I am now, okay? And, uh, and maybe I think I have to admit, I don't think I believed I would have, I would have, that I was worthy to see anything. So I didn't look anyway. Uh, and on my second last day, on Wednesday the 11th of September, I went to climb Appar uh, Cross Mountain. This is the bigger hill, the one with the big cross on the top with my friend Kevin. Kevin is a year younger than I am, so at that time he was 19, I was 20, and we went at four in the morning to climb, and we saw on the mountain where the cross is, this light appeared, this orange golden light, very beautiful. <coughs> and we walked towards it, praying the rosary, as we did. We began with the Apostles' Creed, because I remember in those days in Medjugorje, they used to say that Our Lady said, Pray the Apostles' Creed. The devil is forced to run away from you when you pray the Creed. OK? 
Okay. I remember that was one of the early messages. Was, I've never seen it in a book since, but it's what they used to say, and it's still true. And so we began with the creed and thought, let's carry on with the rosary. So we said the whole rosary, all, all 15 decades as they were then, and walked towards this light. And the light, as we got closer, we could see what the light was. We were still, we were never that close to the light. We must have been at least 300 meters as the crow flies. But we, it seemed like we could see a lot closer. And the light was in the shape of a young girl. She wore a veil on her head, which hung straight down. It didn't go drooping over her shoulders. It hung straight down. And she was very petite, very small, young, 16. And um, she wore a very simple dress, and she held her hands with the palms open in front like this. She had narrow but square shoulders. This detail is so clear in my mind because I remember my thoughts because I was looking at her and thinking, oh, you work out, you know? <laughs> now, <coughs> I, you, have to rem you have to remember I was a kid. I was still a kid. Okay? But this is my first thought when I saw her because she looked quite strong. And also, she stood in a way, a very regal, powerful way. Um, but a slip of a girl, honestly, but, and yet very commanding. There was one part which I almost always leave out, which was just before this, Kevin and I separately had an experience of the evil one, which frightened us separately, which I, I always leave out because then people get scared and then they focus on the devil. And I don't want to talk about the devil because he, he likes attention. I don't want to give him any attention. Okay? But as soon as we saw this young girl made of orange golden light, all fear left us. We were not afraid of anything. And if the devil had chosen to appear right next to us at that moment, we wouldn't have cared, as the Italians say. <laughs> we, we would not have cared one bit. Okay. We just knew we were looking at the most beautiful, beautiful uh, girl that I'd ever seen. So we climbed the mountain, hoping to catch her at the top. And when we were about three quarters of the way up, we looked out, and on the left you can see Apparition Hill, which is a lower hill, about one third the height of this one. And there, there's a spot where Our Lady first appeared. Today there's a beautiful statue marking that spot. In those days, everyone was taking soil from where Our Lady stood. So it was a clear patch of ground. And this same young girl was standing there, with her hands in the same position, but this time facing the church, the parish church of St. James, and facing the village. So we realized, you know, we picked the wrong mountain. And right at the top, there was a couple from Tallahassee who were in their 60s. In my diary at the time, I wrote down, elderly couple from Florida. You know, <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed now, but they were only, they only in their 60s. And uh, they had seen nothing, they had seen nothing. And we didn't tell them what we saw, because we had no desire to talk about it. We couldn't talk about it, actually. It wasn't just a lack of desire. It's like it imposed a silence upon us, and we couldn't speak about it for a long time, except to each other. And um, after that, we went down the mountain and went into the church. And the church was empty. The first mass, the early Croatian mass, had just finished. In those days, I think the Croatian mass finished at 7.30, but I can't remember clearly. I think. So this would have been about 7.35, 7.40. And there were just three of us in church. Kevin went to take pictures of all the stained glass windows. Father Petr Lubicic, who's one of the Franciscans, was watching us, wondering, looking at Kevin, thinking, what's that strange Chinese dude up to? And, because uh, he is Chinese. And <laughs> me, I went to stand facing the statue of Our Lady. I was maybe as far as I am from the sign saying visitors. Okay, so I was near the back of the church. And I wasn't praying, I was just looking at the statue and I was thinking, what is this all about? What's just happened? Have I lost my mind? Um, did I imagine that? And again, and then going back again, what, what just happened? What, you, you know, just all these thoughts over and over again. And while I was thinking this, the second half happened, which was a voice speaking inside me. And before I continue, remember, St. Teresa of Avila gives us some very good advice, very sound advice. She says, voices inside us come from either God or the devil or our imagination. Okay? So, while I will swear on the Bible until I die, 
that I saw on the 11th of September 1991. I saw a beautiful young girl on that mountain with my physical eyes. The voice I heard in the church, I couldn't swear to it because it could be my imagination. It could even be the devil, although I, do, I doubt the devil would say such good things. Or it could be from God. But it was a woman's voice, a very beautiful voice. And she, people often ask, she spoke in English in case you're asking. You know, you know in, in, in Medjugorje, people tease me. They say, how come you, you haven't learned Croatian properly yet? You know, Gospa, our lady speaks Croatian. And I say to them, yes, but it took her 2,000 years to learn it. <laughs> okay, wait, where was I going with this? <laughs> okay. she, spoke, she spoke in English. She had a clear voice. And people say, oh, you know, what kind of accent did she have? I wasn't aware that she had any accent. But then you have to understand, I'm not aware that I have an accent. You know, all around the States, wherever I go, people say to me, oh, you have an accent? You know, sorry. I, I go Southern, don't I, when I try and put on an American accent? Uh, and uh, I think, I haven't got an accent. You do. I I'm, I'm, I'm neutral. This is neutral. <laughs> anyway. So I wasn't aware that she had an accent. I just know she spoke this beautiful voice. And she began, this woman, she just started talking. And she told me my whole life story back to me. But while she did that, she told me all of my unconfessed sins. All of them, every single one. First of all, with regard to my life, she was far more positive than I would have been. But it was strange. It was like from a different, completely different perspective. And then when she told me my sins, she didn't just tell me my sins. She often told me about my motivation behind them. So she'd say things like, you remember when you did this, but you did it for this reason, you know, and that kind of stuff. I mean, she, but she said it so nicely and charitably <laughs> that it wasn't humiliating. It was just very strange. And when she finished, she stopped and she said, you are happy because you've seen me. And I thought, aha. Uh -huh. It's, it's the girl on the mountain. So I said, yes, I'm very happy. Who are you? And she said, I am your mother, the mother of God. I want you to tell everyone you meet that I am their mother and that I love them. You have to understand that when she spoke, she makes you feel exactly what she means. So when she said that I am their mother, she means it like as though we have cost her something as though she had physically given birth to, to every single one of us. Like she's claiming us, you know? Like we, we really belong to her, is what she meant. And then when she said, and that I love them, it's like she hugged my soul to show me how she loves you. And I'm gonna try and describe how she loves you. Our lady loves you like you are the only, only person in the whole world, like there's no one else, you know? Those of you who are not sing, uh, single children, not the only child in the family. You know, you know, when you were growing up, you might have done like what I did, you know, trying to get your, your mom to admit that, uh, she, that you're her favorite, you know. Now, I still do that. I say to my mom, come on, you can tell me. I know, I know I'm your favorite, you know. I won't tell the others. We, you know, they don't deserve to know. <laughs> but every child wants to be the favorite. But in Our, our Lady's eyes, we are. She looks at us like there's no one else. There's only you. And she looks at you like you are absolutely amazing. Like you're marvelous, like you're fantastic, like you're gorgeous. This is how she looks at you. I know this because even at the time I was thinking, I'm not fantastic or marvelous, but there's no use. You cannot fight her. Don't waste any time. She looks at you like this, like you're absolutely, utterly wonderful. Okay? So now, especially those of you, the older ones here, you know, may, maybe you had a bad childhood and you had awful trauma and you can't quite accept yourself or love yourself and you were told all sorts of horrible things when you were children. You have to believe this. Our Lady loves you like this. She really, really, like you're absolutely precious and beautiful. This is how she looks at you, okay? Do you believe that? Good, you'll never need therapy again. <laughs> well, not till next week. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you must believe that because it's true. 
Because if Our Lady loves us like this, how must God love us? God is passionately in love with us, hungry for us. Okay? Now, in the, the conversation, she said right at the beginning, she said, do not begin to imagine that you deserve to see me. God gives grace as he chooses. Okay? So right at the beginning, she said, don't worry about it. You don't deserve this. All right? <laughs> then I said, because I wanted to see her again, how can I arrange this? So I said, Blessed Mother, because that's how I addressed her. I said, Blessed Mother, uh, I'm very happy to have seen you. I'd very much like to die now, please. <laughs> because you know, I was trying to think logically, you know, like, how do I get to see her? Uh-huh, if I drop dead, I'll, have to, I'll see her, right? And she said, would you not like to live a bit longer to help me? And when she said that, I knew she meant anything from a few days to 90 years. I was really disappointed at the thought of having to live and carry on, and, you know. Because I was thinking it would be fantastic. I can drop dead in the church, go with her. Why waste time getting old, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know I'm getting old. I know I'm getting old, you know. Because the other, a couple of months ago, I was with my nephews, and I was holding forth on something and, you know, having my way and saying this. And, I, and they kept quiet, and I was thinking, they're good children, you know, they're listening to me and actually paying attention. And then it occurred to me afterwards, they were thinking, oh, that old buffoon, when is, when is he going to shut up? <laughs> anyway, so that's a sign I'm getting old. <laughs> okay. And she said to me, would you not like to live a bit longer to help me? But she didn't explain what to help her meant. And like I said, a bit longer, she meant anything from nine days to 90 years. So I, I don't think I was being a, given a real choice, but I, at the time I thought it was a real choice. So very reluctantly I said to her, all right then, but you'd better make sure it's worth my while. Because <laughs> okay. I was so disappointed at the thought of having to, you know, and when I said that, she laughed. And she had a beautiful laugh. And when she laughed, I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, and then after that, she took control of the whole conversation. You know, like, you know, when you, all the mothers here, you know, when your children, when you have an idiotic child who says something stupid in front of your friends and neighbors and embarrasses you, you have to kind of take control and shut them up, right? Yeah, so that's what Our Lady did. She, she kind of shut me up. So after that, she did most of the talking. She said, the day will come when you will regret ever having seen me. And I said, no, I won't. This is the best day of my life. And she said, the day will come when you will deny ever having seen me. So even at the time at, that time, at that age, I kept thinking, this sounds like uh, what Peter was told by Jesus, the prediction of his denial. So I thought, good rule of thumb is, quit while you're behind, yeah? So I didn't, I didn't protest. And um, all of this came true, as she said, because within five years of this at medical school, in England, lots of people make fun of Medjugorje. In, you know, in those days, certainly, instead of Medjugorje, they would say mega forgery instead of Medjugorje. Okay, mega forgery. And I, because I was a coward, I used to laugh with them. Okay. Oh, uh, that was the deny seeing her. The regret seeing her was five years after this, at medical school, I said to her, I wish I'd never seen you. Mostly because I had not done anything she asked me to do. And also I felt like a complete freak because I couldn't talk to anyone about this. You know, how are you going to tell people, oh, I saw the mother of God and I spoke to her and she told me to do this, that and the other. You can't. No one's going to believe you, and also you hardly believe yourself. Okay? Um, but so all that came true, as she said. And then she had said, and again, the, her language was like the Gospels. She said, when you turn again, you must hold firm to Jesus. She didn't say hold firm to Medjugorje. She said hold firm to Jesus. And she showed me something about the future. Actually, she, she told me many, 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 many things about the future. And almost all of them were wonderful, glorious things. And she told me I would forget. I said, no, I'm not going to forget. And then after the conversation, I forgot. Okay? So I don't remember those things. The only thing I remember is what she showed me at this part of the conversation. Because she said, are you willing to suffer for my son? And I said, yes. And then she told me where my greatest suffering would come from. And then she, this is the thing she showed me, that a time is coming when almost every Catholic will be ashamed of the words of Jesus, almost every Catholic, and they will turn their backs on him. 
And they will say things like, that doesn't apply to us, we're too sophisticated and advanced, or we don't remember him ever saying that, or something like that. Basically, I guess I'm describing an apostasy. But almost the whole church, almost, I, I can't describe it except to say it's almost like everyone is sleepwalking. I'm saying that metaphorically, okay? It's like everyone will be sleepwalking. A lot of people, very few will hold firm. And the few that hold firm will be persecuted terribly, 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 okay? So when she showed me this thing, I said to her, I asked her for a favor. I said, please let my parents die before this happens. Don't ask me why I prayed for my parents' death, but this is the first thing that occurred to me. I said, please make sure my parents die before this happens. So don't tell my parents, those of you who are recording me, they don't know about this. And they won't be happy. You know, you can imagine Indian parents, you know. You saw the mother of God, you prayed for us to die? What kind of son are you? <laughs> so <laughs> that will not go down well with them. <laughs> you should have been an engineer. <laughs> Actually, my parents don't even sound like that. <laughs> <coughs> then, she told me, you will never enjoy the support of your own, but you will never lack friends among those with a real devotion to me. Okay, that's, I'm not going to explain that because this is part of something else, part of something that I'm supposed to do. Um, but it was, it's, a, it's something that I've seen come true uh, time and time again. So I know each time that happens that she is, she's with me and guiding me and protecting me. And then uh, I told her all of my problems, and she said, give your heart to Jesus, pray with a firm faith, surrender your life to Jesus. This is how she phrased it. Give your heart to Jesus, pray with a firm faith, surrender your life to Jesus. And it was not the answer I wanted, it is the answer I needed. And it's taken me at least 20 years to accept that, or 30 years. <laughs> um, and then she told me not to go looking for her. I would not see her again if I did, but that she will come for me when I'm dying. This is what she said. And then she went, and the conversation stopped. It, took, it felt like it took four hours, four glorious hours of her speaking. On my watch, it was 20 minutes. So I guess it was a bit like Narnia, you know? Time moves differently there and in the real world. I don't know. But it was that kind of thing. Now. Having said all this, this is all very peculiar, because I've often asked, you know, what would I do if I was sat in the audience listening to a little brown dude say, oh, I saw the mother of God and spoke to her. Yeah. I don't ask any of you to believe me. It's not important. Whether you believe me or not, you can be faithful Catholics. But I ask you to believe one thing. Believe that Our Lady loves you. This is important, because if you're paying attention, this is the only reason I'm telling this story. She said, Tell everyone you meet that I am their mother and that I love them. She also told me, I forgot to say this, she told me that many will believe because, because of me. <laughs> okay. She told me, I, I'm going to paraphrase what she said. She, this is not exactly her words, but she said basically, people will believe me because they will look at me and think, he's worse than I am. <laughs> and therefore I believe it. <laughs> okay. But that, that's kind of what she said, okay? So I, th I think it's quite funny, actually. The, the, like the one and only time that I saw her and spoke to her, she tells me basically that I'm really lousy. You know? <laughs> she said, I, I was going to regret seeing her, deny seeing her, <laughs> etc. But it is funny. But also a very beautiful experience. Now, I, do not envy me at all. You mustn't think, oh, you're so blessed to have seen Our Lady and spoken to her. Our Lady is with every single one of you. Every single one of you. She is utterly close to you. I am not special, There's, I have no special gifts. This grace I received, like she said, I don't deserve it. Uh, and there's another reason for it, okay, uh, to do with the suffering. But you are all blessed by her. She is with you, she is close to you, very close to you. Do you believe that? She is our mother, and this is why she comes. Her presence with us in Medjugorje is to convert us every day convert us to Jesus. And this is important. Now, actually, with that, I should actually now start talking very quickly about the five stones 
really after me is Franjo. Franjo is going to speak, and you should listen to him. You shouldn't be listening to me. You know, he was there. He and uh, Slavenko were there from the beginning, more or less, and they saw so many things, witnessed so many beautiful things. The five stones are the heart of Our Lady's messages in Medjugorje. They're called five stones because of David, the shepherd boy. He goes to meet Goliath, taking a staff, a sling, and five pebbles from the stream. So these are weapons that Our Lady gives us. And the first weapon is, she says, pray with the heart. Molite srtse. It means pray from the heart. Pray like you mean it. Pray the, the words that come from the heart. Don't just say words from your lips. Okay? And I want you to, to think about when we apologize, you know, when we say sorry. I know you're all polite. Americans are all very, very polite. And you, you're sincere. In England, we're not so sincere, okay? We, we are masters of passive aggression, you know? So if someone steps on my foot or bumps into me, I will turn to them and say, sorry, meaning, get off my foot, you idiot. <laughs> yeah? Or you get, you get, unfortunately, more and more, you get like a politician caught getting up to hanky-panky, and he or she will say, I'm sorry for the distress this has caused the people I represent and to my family. Meaning, I'm sorry I got caught. I wish I could get away with it. I know it's a bit cynical. But when a small child, a small child says sorry, they cry. And they cry because they mean it. The sorry comes from the heart. This is what Our Lady means by pray with the heart. Pray and mean it. But she says something quite mysterious. She says, pray the rosary from the heart. Pray the rosary from the heart. What is the rosary? The rosary is a time machine. Because when you pray the third joyful mystery, you're not just imagining the first Christmas. The power of the first Christmas comes to you today, now, wherever you are. Okay? So it's a time machine in that sense. I want to tell you a quick story. I need to tell you this story, unfortunately. <laughs> to emphasize the rosary. When I was a kid, my parents went out for the evening. They left us to mind ourselves. We got bored. We took down all the old black and white photo albums. And we were looking through these pictures, my grandparents' wedding, that kind of stuff. And we were thinking, oh, look, it's our family, but we're not in these pictures. So what can we do about that to set that straight? So we got a big orange crayon. Yeah, yeah. And yes, and it gets worse. We drew ourselves in. You know, so my mother's baptism, there's a gigantic stick figure version of my sister <laughs> looming over the cradle with a crazy grin. My, my parents' wedding, all four of us are in the front row, <laughs> waving, you know. Okay. Does this, <laughs> bizarrely, this reminds me of Renaissance paintings in Italy. Why? And because it was a masterpiece, even if I say so myself. It was a masterpiece. <laughs> but because, what do you get? You get like the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem, Our Lady, St. Joseph, angels, wise men, shepherds, and Don Cosimo and his wife, Donna Fab Fabrizia. <laughs> and you think, what are they doing there? That's what the rosary is. It's your orange crayon to draw yourself in, into that masterpiece. It's a time machine. The power of those mysteries comes to you today, now, when you pray the rosary. Now, Our Lady began with the villagers slowly. She said, pray, pray the seven Our Fathers, seven Hail Mary, seven Glory Bees. This is their local tradition anyway. So they prayed this. They asked her, shall we pray this? She said, yes. So they did. They prayed that every day. After a while, she said, please add the Apostles' Creed. So they did. That, by the way, that's her favorite prayer, the Apostles' Creed. And then, after a few months, she said, I would like you to pray five decades of the rosary every day. So they did. And a few months after that, she said, now please pray every day 15 decades of the rosary, the complete rosary. And when she said that, the villagers said, oh, that's too much, yeah, this is impossible, you know. And she said, you do not understand what little time this takes up. What does she mean by that? Because if you pray the rosary properly, it will take you, I mean, five decades will take you 15 minutes, if you say it properly. Properly yeah. meaning slowly, you know. In Singapore, where I grew up, we used to gabble the rosary quickly, 
at what we, even in those days in Singapore, we used to call it Irish speed. You know, we'd say it so quickly. If you've ever been to Ireland, you'll know what I mean, okay? And I remember this Buddhist friend of mine said, you Catholics, you're so weird. What's so blessed about a monk swimming? And we were all scratching our heads thinking, what is he talking about? And we didn't understand until we began the rosary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou, a monk swimming. So, slow down, slow down. Now remember, remember the rosary is powerful. The demons hate the rosary. During exorcisms, the demons will say, we hate that thing. They use a word I can't use. They say, we hate that poo. And then they say, thankfully, most priests don't promote it anymore. But the rosary is powerful, okay? Every Hail Mary is a hammer blow to Satan's head. Every rosary destroys their power, are chains that bind the demons. Okay? But don't just pray for, uh, to eliminate evil. Pray because it sanctifies us. And Our Lady asks for it. So she says, pray the ros rosary from the heart every day. The second stone is Holy Mass. She says, go to Holy Mass as often as possible in a, and receive communion in a state of grace. Go early, prepare with silence before Mass. Never leave Mass without making your thanksgiving. She also said to the villagers, to those who habitually come late, would be better for them not to come. Okay? Now, so the Mass is obviously very important. Now, the Mass, do not think of the Mass as, oh, you know, it's boring or it's tedious or whatever. For example, if I said to you, you know, my mother's birthday, I'm tired of celebrating my mother's birthday because, you know, she gets all her bingo pals, they come around and, all, and they all make cake and then they feed me cake and then, you know, the typical perverse Indian way, then they say, oh, you are so fat now. And I'm, t I'm tired of this abuse, you know, every year. Actually, the story, by the way, is fake. This, my mother doesn't play bingo. She has no pa bingo pals. But, and actually, but her friends do feed me cake, and they do tell me I'm fat. Now, if I said, right, I've had enough of this abuse. From now on, I'm not going to celebrate my mother's birthday anymore. Would that be okay? No? <laughs> I'm not serious. Don't worry. About <laughs> okay. The reason for that is my mother's birthday is about her, not about me, right? Mass is not about what we get out of it. Mass is about what we've come to give Jesus. So don't ever think, oh, I get nothing out of Mass, I'm bored. No, who says it's got anything to do with you? It's, it's got to do with what have you come to bring Jesus? What have you come to offer him during the offertory? Because he wants your whole self, body and soul, put on the pattern as the priest lifts it up. That's what he wants, okay? So remember the Mass is a celebration that takes place in heaven. Not, it's not about us down here. We're all caught up in a heavenly worship. Okay, the third stone is Holy Bible, which Father preached about today. Our Lady says, put the Bible in a prominent place in the family home. Let everyone read from it, even the children. Root it in your heart. Read especially the Gospels. Now here, are we part of the Bible Belt here? Yes? Okay. You've got to know the Bible, because it's our book. <laughs> okay? It's a Catholic book. And as Father said, we, we have, well, we don't have extra books. It's just that the Protestant Bible is, was mutilated by Martin Luther. He threw out seven books that he didn't like, and parts of some other books. I remember, you know, at my monastery, this Protestant friend came around for, for dinner, and he was, a bit, he was early. I was in the shower, and he texted me, and, you know, and he was kind of showing off, you know, and he said, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice, I will enter and I will dine with him, you know. So I came out of the shower and I saw this message, and I thought, I'll show him. I'll show him Catholics know the Bible too. So I wrote back Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. Behold, I heard the sound of thy voice in the garden, but I was naked and afraid and I hid myself. <laughs> This, this is a true story. This is a true story. <laughs> Read the Bible every day. Read especially the Gospels, okay? Because St. Jerome says, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. You know, you'd never believe, if you were courting, you'd never believe your beloved if they said, oh, shut up, don't tell me anything about you, just let me love you. 
You know, you'd say to that person, welcome to Dumpsville, population you, right? <laughs> Get rid of them, yeah. In the same way with Jesus, can Jesus believe us if we don't, that we love him if we don't read the Bible? No. So we've got to read it. And also the Bible is powerful. You know, I think your, my ancestors, although I'm from Singapore, my ancestors are from Kerala in southwest India, the very Catholic part of India. And they all seem to be charismatics. I think there are a lot of Kerala priests throughout the states as well now. It's like the New Ireland, they're exporting priests and nuns everywhere. And uh, they are very big into charismatic phenomena and healing through the scriptures. I've seen this, you know, they will read the word of God and people get healed through hearing the word of God. So remember the word of God is powerful. When you hear the word of God at mass, you can be healed in your soul and in your body. So be aware of that, okay? Be open to God and you will see, experience these miracles. The fourth stone is, okay, fasting. Our Lady says, fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Fast strictly on Wednesdays and Fridays. The best fast is on bread and water. With fasting, you can stop natural laws and suspend wars. Stop wars. Okay. She also says she needs fast her to convert people. She needs our fasting. My Jewish friend says, said to me once, you know, he said, you Catholics, when you say fasting, you mean you don't eat in between meals. Okay, think about our fasting. We have two days of fasting, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday. That's the only two days left. Maybe 40 to 60 years ago, we had more than 100 days of fasting. and They're all gone now, sadly. And on those two days, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, you can have one full meal, and then you can have two small meals, which added together must add up to one meal. We call this fasting, right? But <laughs> this is what most people eat in the world on a good day. Okay, but fasting is powerful. Pray for the grace to be able to fast. Those of you, Our Lady is actually, although she invites us to fast, she's also strict. She says, no one is excused, not even the elderly, only the sick. And then she says, but for the sick, she says, let him who smokes give up cigarettes. Let him who drinks give up alcohol. Let him who watches television turn off the TV. Actually, in the early messages, at least six messages I counted, she said, turn off the TV. You don't need it. I think, what would she say about smartphones and the internet now, you know? We have no, she said in the early messages, she said, when you watch the news, you have no peace left in you, and then you are unable to pray. So in the same way, you know, if you're constantly on Instagram, trying to get likes from your fake friends and living a fake life, I mean, that's tragic, right? Super tragic, uber tragic, that's not life. Turn it off, throw it away. I think we, we need to go back to the, the old kind of Nokia phones, if we're going to have phones. <laughs> you know, actually, we got on perfectly well before mobile fo cell phones were invented, didn't we? I remember life before cell phones. Anyway, we need peace to be able to do that. But fasting is important. Now, Ash Wednesday is coming up. I know lots of people will tell you, rather than giving up something, you should add on a, a new good thing or something. That's not entirely true. Giving up something that you're entitled to is powerful. Making a sacrifice is powerful. So, and Our Lady needs this. She said in Fatima 100 years ago, today more souls go to hell because not enough people pray and make sacrifices. Okay, the last stone is holy confession. Our Lady says, go to confession at least once a month, make a sincere and humble confession of all your sins, if the West went to confession once a month, whole regions of the West would be converted. Now, to confess your sins, I have a little formula to help you. And all you have to do is remember these three words, and you'll know how to confess. The sentence is, confess your sins, period. Confess your sins, okay? And by emphasizing each word, you'll see. Number one, confess. It has to be a confession. You know, if you come and say, Father, maybe I did this, maybe I did that, then uh, the priest is thinking, maybe I absolve you, maybe I don't. <laughs> okay. Number two, confess your sins. They must be yours. Father, my husband makes me so mad. You know, he's such an idiot. I think he does it deliberately. Still, he's not as bad as my daughter-in-law. Oh, oh, I don't like her. Oh, 
And I don't like how she's raising my grandkids. Still, she's a saint compared to my pastor. He's doing all these old-fashioned things. I don't like it. I don't like it. Okay. You want to confess other people's sins? I'm happy to absolve them. You can go to hell. Your family will be okay. Remember, confess your own sins. Life is too short. Confess your own sins. Third word, confess your sins. Do not confess emotions, feelings, sentiments. Confess sins. Okay? Father, my brother is an addict and I didn't give him any money. I feel so bad. Well, you did the right thing. I know, but I feel so bad. Well, you did the right thing. I know, but I still feel so bad. Well, you need therapy. Okay. <laughs> Do not confess feelings. Resist the temptation to tell stories. I know that I'm saying this on behalf of all the priests. Okay, resist the temptation to tell stories. <gasps> Father, last Tuesday, no, I tell a lie, it was Wednesday, it was bingo night, I remember. You know, the doorbell went and I went to look through the people. And it was my friend, Betty. And uh, I was so frightened, I ran out through the back door, I put on my brown shoes, not my black ones. And then I leapt over the hedge into the alleyway. And then meanwhile, Betty had nipped around to the back and she caught me and she said, Oh, Mildred, you're wearing your brown shoes, not your black shoes. <laughs> okay. You know, when you do all this, the poor priest is there thinking, what are you confessing? Is it a fashion faux pas or what? You know? <laughs> Just confess your sins, okay? Don't, you don't have to tell the whole story. Um, and the other, one last thing, I want you to remember confession is not just the forgiveness of sins, it is God giving us grace to change us. It's like, really, really, it's like a spiritual ATM machine that's just throwing out all this money. And you can take as much as you can carry. How often would you go? Every day. How many of you would go every day? Okay, a few honest people. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> Because everyone would go here every day, I know, okay. But think about that. We would do that for, for money, which is going to rot in this life. What should we do for treasure in heaven, where thieves cannot break in and steal, and rust and moth cannot destroy, okay? So remember, in confession, God gives us grace to change us. Don't be afraid of confession. The priests do not care about your sins. We don't remember you. We don't look and think, ah. Oh, you dirty stop out. I know what you got up to. You know, look at Slavenka. I've never, heard, I've never heard a confession. But we do not. I'll tell you the truth. When someone confesses humbly, we think, I think, this person is so holy, holier than me, far holier. When come, someone comes in and tells me how wonderful they are, it makes me sad. Because, you know, they're close to grace. And people do that. They will tell you. They'll tell you, I'm amazing. I'm wonderful. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Just confess your sins, humbly. You know, I'm not surprised. If you find it hard to confess, it's probably because you're not going often enough. If I go skiing every three years or seven years, am I going to be a world-class skier? No. If you don't confess your sins regularly, you're not going to be so good at confessing. All right? But don't be afraid of it. And do not worry about what the priest thinks. We do not care. And besides, all of you always go to the next parish to confess, right? <laughs> I know, I know. I was a pastor once, I remember. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to end there. These are the five stones, okay, and to recap. Pray with the heart. Pray the rosary from the heart. Holy Mass, prepare for it and make your thanksgiving. Receive Christ in a state of grace. Holy Bible, read it every day. Fast, Wednesdays and Fridays. Pray for the grace to be able to fast. And in case you're wondering, she means... All of Wednesday, 24 hours Wednesday, 24 hours Friday, okay? Uh, and also bread, people ask me, can I have raisins on it and oatmeal? I, you know, bread which is not cake, water which is not vodka or gin, okay? <laughs> and last, last but not least, uh, confession. At least once a month, or if you need to go more often, then more often, but at least once a month. Humbly confess all your sins, okay? So these are the five stones. They are Our Lady's simple way of converting us. And actually, if you look in the catechism under the section on conversion, you will see the five stones listed there in the catechism. So Our Lady has, but she said this before the catechism was written. Okay, so Our Lady has a very simple way to lead us to Jesus. Don't, be, don't think of it as boring or difficult. 
do it. Do it while you have the time. Because we don't know how much time is left to us. I, I'm not talking about some apocalypse or something. I just mean, you know, when you're crossing the road, you might be knocked down and die. <laughs> you know, it could be the end of the world for us personally, any day. Today could be, could be my last day. But live in such a way that you are ready to go, whenever that moment might be. And then you'll find you're actually living without worrying about anything anymore. God bless you. God love you.